Since time immemorial, stories have connected people from the past to the present and shaped the future. Hello, I'm Joanna, and I'm on a mission to inspire, imagine, explore, and discover paths of becoming through stories and community. Now, join me on a special journey with today's guest. Ciao, sono Mario Martino. I'm a dad and an architect. I've always loved. Love learning from story because I feel a connection having the one-on-one conversations. So part of this project is to connect with people who I know and people who I don't know to really build up a library of stories so that not only you and I can learn from each other, young people around the world can benefit from having a more diverse. Perspective as to what it takes to be successful, to get out of the silo narrative of you have to get good grades, you have to find a good job to have a good life. This is a great opportunity for us to not only share our experiences or share your experiences, but also、mm-hmm. as an audience for me to learn from you. So, with that in mind, I wanted to start our conversation by. How do you imagine that you're in a library, and you just saw someone walk up to a bookshelf, and that individual picked up an autobiography? They flip to the page of introduction. How would you be introducing yourself in your own autobiography? I am a visual person, and so when you talk about a library, I can imagine it like. Old library with whole dust and the light filtering through, and I imagine this young girl, little girl, going and picking for who knows what reason this old book, all cracked with all this old architect, and she opens this page and there is like just a white page, and there is only one request: trace a line, just trace a line, because the most important thing to me is. Was always trying to come out of your shell. It doesn't matter what line you trace. It doesn't matter if you are able to sketch or not. Just trace your line, and that's the beginning of our journey. Because this is exactly the beginning of the journey. The second page would be, "Hi, Mario." And I don't know if I will ever describe me as an architect. I will describe me as a father, as as basically your. Friend coming with you on this journey. For me, a book always have been a journey. I always love stories. I cannot tell you where this is coming from. Actually, when we were young, we didn't have it in TV, and so probably there was somebody reading these stories. And I love storytelling, and there's nothing better than hear stories from a friend. That's why I love when friend comes back from a trip. I want to hear all the stories. So there is something silly for me when you read books. There are so many books about architect. Architecture is what I love,、mm-hmm. and you open and you see this bio written by somebody else that doesn't know the architect、mm-hmm. that speaks in third person. When you read the stories about Le Corbusier, Alvar Aalto, or Miss Van der Rohe, all these master, great master,、mm-hmm. they were humble human being, and I'm pretty sure they were not even aware of their impact on future generation. So the reader is now flipping through the pages, lands on the chapter where you talk about your childhood. Take us back. What age would you take us back to? What was it like? I think it was a long time ago. I can describe you the little town.、It、was a fisherman little town in southern Italy. I didn't come from a big city. I didn't come from a wealthy family. I remember me running on these rocks. We have rockery blocking from the big waves and protecting the sheep. And I remember the first idea was like my father and my mother yelling at me, "Watch out! Be careful!" And I was running as only one young kid can do without falling. We don't fear in this rockery, this black massive lava rock from the volcano, from the Zuvi volcano. And then something happened. I think because I remember clearly one day I was six, and the first time I was not the the rascal running away, because I turned myself and I found my dad, my father, running with me, and not to me, running with me on the rockery, and we had so much fun. 
And I think that was one of the first memory where I felt not just a son, but I felt my father being a friend. And I felt supported with this just passion of running on rocks like a kid, right? So I felt for the first time probably freedom because I could do something really dangerous, but the people that love me say, go ahead, go faster. Instead of saying, stop, be careful, you can fall. And, but I found myself like a, almost in a Miyazaki kind of cartoon. That's where, that's where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. But then something happened. And for lack of work, we had to move to the north part of Italy, to Milano. And the same little kid was introduced to a classroom. And I was really shy because everything was new. We had a new house, a new school, new people, a new dialect. I've always been very shy, always been very shy. Even people say, oh, you are so social. It took a long time. At that time, there was this weird hate for people from the South. People from the North didn't like people from the South. And they, they used to call me with names. Uh, and it was hard. It was hard because I didn't understand. I mean, my childhood was, has been fantastic, <laughs> running free. And yeah. the city, those guys from the city were not free as I was. But they were really like judging and just because I was from the South. That was, I remember, so uh, oh, you are Mario, you are the new kid, you are from Naples, right? I say, yay, hoping to play. And nope, that was, the reaction was just a straight punch in the face. Yeah, that changed my relationship with my peers. That's when I started drawing because other people were just looking and playing soccer. And I was by myself and I didn't know what to do. So I started drawing. <laughs> Everything started there. And so how old were you by then? I was probably 12. So how did you, so you mentioned about drawing as an escape for you. Can you yeah. share a little bit more about that? The story behind that, it's that it's really tied to my family. So my mother, uh, she's an Italian teacher and she spent a lot of time as all mothers and fathers teaching at school. Uh, my father, he is a lawyer. And so art was not a part of our house. We didn't mention about art. And there were no drawings. Again, there was no TV. We got some books. But my brother, his older brother, he didn't really care about drawings. And so something happened when uh, Nonna Ketty, my grandmother, uh, I remember my, my parents left me for like one week in our place. And she mentioned that my name, actually, Mario, was the same name of my grandfather I never met, Nonno Mario. And I was like, wow, I didn't know. And she said, you want to see something special? I'm like, yeah, yeah. So my grandfather was a surgeon. And probably has been so painful for my mother to losing him that nobody was talking about him. And that's why I love your message. Nobody was telling the young Mario about his grandfather, Mario. There was like the generation, there was a crack in the generation. There was no message passed, but that's where magic happened. Because Katy uh, took me by hand. We went outside. We went upstairs on the roof of this building. And there was a little shed in this building. And it was almost like creepy. And then we opened the door and I realized that my grandfather was a painter, I didn't know. So I entered in this studio that my grandmother didn't have the, the heart to tear it apart or just take everything out. She left everything as it was, as he left. And I can smell the, the oil, the, the oil color, the palette, everything. And I was surrounded by sketches and painting. And I was like, what is this? And she said, this is your grandfather. And to me, that was a very important day because I realized that this man had a double side. Mm. He was the surgeon. So almost the perfect man to marry at that time. We're talking about Second World War, yeah. perfect man to marry. But he was living through so much stress mm. to work on his, the life of a person was depending on his hands. Mm. Something that we don't realize about surgery. And the only way for him to this, this is stress, like run away from the stress was painting. And so probably there, something triggered in my mind that I, it was not, I was not aware. And probably 
when there's a trauma, my grandfather used painting to cure and heal. Mm -hmm. And probably at the same time, sketching and drawing for me was a way to heal myself from the trauma. I still, in my, in my office, I have pictures of drawings, pictures of projects that I'm really proud of. And I have one small little painting of my grandparents. And actually it's not a painting, it's a sketch. So it's, it's raw, it's pure express, expressivity. And that's always there to me, to remind me about that day. And so did you have a shift in your identity? Yeah. I mean, was that, because you mentioned when, when the bad things happened and so yeah. that kind of got you to focus on drawing and your world kind of closed in because you weren't interacting with other kids. Yeah, something, yeah, something changed. I was, it, it's funny, I was uh, playing basketball professionally. So I was the classic, very tall guy, noodly. You know, we are teenagers, so our body is not proportionate. And so I was spending a lot of time training basketball. Okay. And then, yeah, that was part of my life too. But still, I could not mingle with the other guys around me. And I have my group of nerds friends. We play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. So we could pretend to be strong, have a sword, be warrior, go against dragon. But we weren't able to say, hi, how's it going in the morning to other people? So there was a lot of storytelling and something happened about, I can tell you this game, the role-playing game helped me a lot because there was an escape part and music. I remember the first concert that I ever been, I was 14, it was the Nirvana concert. For me, that changed, it was a blast. About music, it's about expressivity and I could see somebody was older than me, clearly in pain and I was 14 and I can read that person. And and this guy was yelling, screaming. And that means this guy was letting things out. And I was like, I understand why you're screaming. And I like you. I'm with you. Like, that was the feeling. But at that time, when you were in Italy, you were hearing like grunge music, punk music, you were an outcast. You were a person to, to not hang out with. So at that time, remember that time, there were articles describing Dungeons and Dragons as almost dangerous for kids. It was storytelling, and they said they were satanists. They were describing something that a group of nerds, little kid, were playing with as dangers. So all of a sudden, this 14 years old Mario was very dangerous for the society. Music you were shaping your identity. Yeah, and I, I, I started to shape the fact that I was, I, what I was doing, what I really liked, was not what I was supposed to like. And so that's where even like some cracks with my family happened. So were your family also against what you were doing? Uh, and were standing with the society? They were concerned. They were concerned because I had long hair. They were concerned because I had like jeans that were ripped. And they were concerned about all this screaming they were hearing from my room, <laughs> all this music, <laughs> this loud music. And yeah, they were concerned. Uh, not worried, but concerned about that, that thing. But after a while, they, they tried to speak me out of it. But there was no way. I mean, I, I got maybe two, three good friends that I love to spend time with. Mm -hmm. They tried me to push me to spend more time with somebody else that was more appropriate. But the problem is that that was not appropriate for them. You know, I'm so, I'm so yeah. glad you're talking about this because what you're talking about it's the same experience for still a lot of people and i can relate to some of the things you're talking about so i'm so glad you're talking about this because i it's good to hear and i hope we can normalize that it is tough being a teenager you will be doing things that other people don't approve and so i guess my question to you is in that moment, do you feel like you had to force yourself to change to in ways that you didn't want to, but you thought it's almost like a survival instinct, right? When everybody's kind of going against what you're doing, you kind of need to like fit in. Like, was that ever a challenge yeah. for you or did you just didn't care? Like, I'm just going to be who I am and I'm going to continue to no. like, like. Oh, it's been like, it was a challenge because I saw my brother, my older brother as being the perfect son, always dressing nice. And so it, it was hard. It was hard. And the more, it was almost like digging a hole where I was buried and I didn't want anybody to see me mm. because I, I thought I was wrong. I thought everything I like is wrong. Then why I like it? 
what's wrong with me? And that's why the teenager right. become introvert. Reflect back to yourself. Yeah. I think that probably it's what really saved me. Mm. <laughs> I have to think about it because we're going to go there later. But yeah. I think that was really good for me mm. because it was the first time that where I realized that even if I was different from the other, I was truly me. Self. I'm, I'm so glad you, you kind of mm. kept that piece. Yeah. And so, so it sounds like your coping mechanisms, you kind of go through those difficult years. You mentioned about drawing, yeah. you mentioned about playing basketball. Did you love basketball or were you doing it because you felt like this is one of the, for in, in the U.S., it's the cool thing, right? You're yeah. on the basketball team and you're tall. So you yeah. got to <laughs> build for that. Like, was that, like, how did you, how did you look at basketball? That's funny. So I can tell you more. Uh, basketball, my mother played in the national team. Oh, right. I my mother played in the national team. My brother loved, he loved basketball. And I remember that my father and my mother went to all his games. Every weekend, they went to his game. And so I think doing basketball, playing basketball was, was because I was supposed to play basketball. And I think part of me is because I wanted my parents to come to see my game. And then they never did. The truth is that Sunday morning was always the, the game. And I, I don't want to be tragic, but they, they always went to my brother because it was probably more challenging. They were older and probably my game were kind of boring because <laughs> what was always up. And so I think you need to know something else that during that time I was doing basketball secretly, secretly, I was taking lesson of medieval sword. Yeah, because there was probably the Dungeons and Dragons part of me that said, I'm, it's not enough, the story. I want to be a real hero. I want to have a real sword. And so basketball was more the sport I have, I'm supposed to do because I'm tall and my family has a heritage. But the true Mario was the one doing medieval sword. But can you believe my parents, poor parents, to have somebody rebellious that wants to go around with a sword? You know, but I love how you... You know, it's really fascinating because on the one hand, you're, you're kind of seeking the, right, every child does this attention of the parents, right? You want the love, you yeah. want the, the protection, you want the attention. And at the same time, like you were still pursuing what you genuinely love. Yeah. And that's pretty cool because I didn't, you know, if I think about myself, it mm -hmm. was always about what do I think will make me feel like I'm a good kid? Yeah. So I never got to the other side of, okay, who is Joanna and what is she like? So I love like hearing about how you actually didn't really give up unfolding will be, and, and we'll, we'll definitely get into that soon. So having all these experiences, I can't believe we already like have, didn't know about before. <laughs> how did that idea of an architect emerge from all of this through Very the challenges good. and things? It's very precise. Uh, and I remember, so we, in Italia, you have the elementary school that is five years. Now you have the media three years. Now you have uh, liceo that is five years. And I wanted to do the artistic liceum. So in Italia, you already pick a career that is artistic, mathematical, and science or literature. And I pick the math path just because my brother did. I didn't want to do it. Mm. I was not brave enough because how can you tell your parents that are a lawyer and a teacher Italiano that I want to be an artist. And again, we're not wealthy. So it would be like, I would never be taken seriously. So I was not brave enough and I compromised and I, it was really hard for five years because I'm not good at math. <laughs> Simply is not my logic. And I wanted to draw and that was painful because I, I was creating media. I wanted to try plaster, all kind of paint and sculpture, but, I had to do that in my spare time after homework, if mm -hmm. I had time. And then I remember there were two things happening. One thing, the last year of Liceo, I got a history teacher. Uh, she changed, probably she changed my life. Uh, we were telling, there, there is an interrogation where basically it's an interview where you need to show that you learned something or you didn't wow. study. And uh, it was funny. I, I studied, I love history. So we start to talk. And then I don't know why we went to a path where I started to tell a story about this man during the Second World War that was not a book, but something that 
something I found at the library that was the, the true story of this old man. I don't remember the name. It was a partigiano. And instead of telling, you know, the full story of the Second World War, I told her the story of this man, just this regular human being. Mm -hmm. And she said, she gave me the highest mark oh, wow. ever. That was 10. I was like yeah. shocked. And she said, even if it's, you didn't say anything that I asked for, you just told me something that I didn't know. And so I think that was inspiring because uh, this teacher told me it doesn't matter if you don't give me the right answer, but your life had an impact on mine. Uh, and it's, uh, she was the first one telling me about storytelling. And anyway, it's been a fantastic moment. Then again, compromise. I was not brave enough. And I actually it was something else that uh, at the end of the five years of the child, you need to do like an interview. It's massive. And in Italy, it's, it's massive. You need to do three days of testing plus an interview on all the topics. The professor can ask anything from dinosaur to, you know, to contemporary story. Oh. You need to know everything and you are tested. And so... It's scary. It's really scary. And I remember there was this other teacher asked me about, she was nice. She was supposed nice. And she said, tell me something about history that you were curious about. And Joanna, I was curious about the fall of the Soviet bloc and about Gulag. Wow. The Gulag are the, the, you know, the working camp for the Soviet Union during the Second World War. And, and I was talking about this because it's, I like how story is written by winner, but there's always another side. So I was curious because everybody talks about one side of the story, but they don't talk about the other one. And that was my interest. I, I was not old enough to vote. It was just interesting for me as a story. And, but I found the wrong teacher. This wrong teacher was very politically. Mm -hmm. And she basically said that I was monopolizing the interview and I made it a political interview. And she gave me zero and she destroyed my career. She literally destroyed my career. And she said uh, that gulags never existed. And Khrushchev as a president was the worst man ever. And the gulag never existed. And I remember telling, but it's on the book. It's in history book. Not very personal for the teacher. Yeah. And she said, I don't care what books say. And so that moment I was internally muted i i could not i didn't have any more feeling it was more than sadness mm -hmm. because all of a sudden my dream of finally be able to do something artistic because i have enough you know credit crumbled mm -hmm. crumbled for somebody else and i got zero and i found myself squares one zero and so i was so powerless that i decided maybe i should conform and so uh, I was talking with my aunt and she said, Mario, you cannot do this to your father. He's a lawyer. Your uncle is a uh, com commercialist He's on finance. And you and your brother are the only two men. Believe that. You are the only lasting two men of the family. You have a family behind you. You cannot betray them. You better study finance. And I was like, okay, it's time. And that day, cut my hair. Cut my hair. I had used to have long hair cut my hair, uh, cut off the piercing. And I said, okay, I'm done with sword. I'm done with Dungeons and Dragons. I'm done with everything. I started to put like a dry shirt to go to the university. And I, I was suffering. I was in pain. I did all the exams possible. In uh, two years of economy, I did all the exams. And more exams I were doing, the more my father was proud of me. And so I finally had my family that was proud of me, not my brother, mm -hmm. me. And so I was trying to say, this is my way. This is my way. I definitely, this is my way. And my uncle, that was a big name in Italy as a commercialist, it was like, good job. Yeah, if you're good like that, you're going to work for me. My so uncle is recognized. Enforcement for everybody on this path. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, I became this like finance shark. Mm. <laughs> and, but then there were two things. I realized that some, the message that was delivered in the university was a message I could not cope with. And the message was that basically, I remember it was this macroeconomia book about a, an exam. And it was talking about how the good CEO has to operate. And it's fundamental to find the way 
or having somebody reminding you the names of your employee, their birthday, and their kid's name. And this to improve their performances. When I read that chapter, I was like, what am I doing? This is an human. This is not what I believe. And so I start to have that little crisis. And now all of a sudden, the little Mario is in this big university with like 300 people crowded. And there is this small teacher down there, small teacher like that. Say, <laughs> you up there, what are you doing? I didn't think she was talking about me, but she was talking about me. Mm. And I realized that I, I was drawing a game Come because on. everybody has to be like, you know, following class. She asked me yeah. to bring that paper because she thought I was passing notion or something. And then this teacher, Statistica, Statistic Sciences, crack in a laugh because I was drawing her caricature. <laughs> And she was cracking a laugh and she said, Miss Martino, you are probably not the best student and you should follow my lesson. But can I keep this? And so I was like, wait a second. There was a mixed message. She was supposed to scold me, but at the same time, she wanted to keep my drawing. Right. And so I went back in my seat. People were laughing, the classic bullying. But then I realized that the way I was taking annotation when I was studying, it was visually. I didn't write words on the side of the book. I was drawing to remember what I was studying. And I was like, okay, something is off. <laughs> I had to change career. And so a bunch of new friends, more correct people to hang with. And I came back and I remember I took the maximum uh, score for this exam, 30, but I was not happy. And I closed myself in my room and I was crying. It's stupid because you should be happy. My father was happy. My mother was happy. I was crying in my room. That was a clear sign that something wasn't right. Yeah. And I went and I talked about it with my dad, my mother. They were always supportive, but they said, we cannot tell you what to do. Uh, we want to tell you that art is dangerous. You can set up for failure. And yes, you are really good in drawings, but so many other people. And so be careful of your choice. We will be here for you, but we think you're doing a mistake. And I was like, I'm on my own. And so what happened again, I escaped. I ran away from my place. Because I ran away because it was too hard to disappoint my parents. Mm -hmm. And I left. Didn't leave a message. I just left. Took a train and I said, I'm going to go to Holland, Amsterdam, because it was a school that apparently was giving a lot of possibility for people to just study. Uh, it was not without income, but basically, I don't, I don't remember to say that English, but maybe you, you have credits to study there. And the other thing was like, yeah, that was the moment where I decided that I need to change something. Now, why architecture? There is a funny story about that too. I didn't want to be an architect. I was not born like it. I read all these fantastic architects that say, I was born when I was four. I was doing houses with Lego. No, I was not born to be an architect. Absolutely not. Uh, no, I cannot define myself an architect at six years. I was the kid running on the rocks. That was, that was who I was at that time. And on this train going to Amsterdam, I made this beautiful young woman that she saw me sketching on the train. She said, hey, Wow, those are nice sketches. Are you going to Mendrisio, to the uh, University of uh, Architecture in Mendrisio in Switzerland? I was like, no, really, no, I'm just going. I don't know where. And I remember she was blonde, long rasta, but, and she was, hey, you should come with me. I think this university is something that you're going to like. And I didn't have any plan. And okay. And I dropped off. We were in this train. We went to this university, and this university was very avant-garde. Was like they were accepting only thirty students every year, and we went there. And the first lesson I went, I went with her. The first lesson was blood and photography. Mm. So for a teenager, it was not just photography; it was blood and photography. And I was like, "What is this? Is this architecture?" And so I start, I 
I was supposed to stay just at night and I stayed a week. And I realized that this school was doing uh, theater, philosophy, photography, architecture, because this school was born after the dream of the Bauhaus. Oh, wow. by the they were done by these masters, this master, where they were gathering the best. I don't like the best as word, but the most influential mm. storyteller, philosopher, scientist, and architect mm. to create a new kind of university where you don't just study architecture, so you cool. study multiple things. Yeah. And I did that. I got my uh, credit and everything I could study. And then finally, after one year, I meet again with my dad and my mother. And my dad says, I have to say that you are brave because you did something I was not brave enough to do because he didn't want to be a lawyer. Yeah. And then uh, we, I remember it was Christmas time. It was close. My birthday is on the 23rd. It was Christmas time. Everybody was happy because Mario was back. And we met uh, my uncle, Luigi. Uh, I said, uncle, I'm sorry that I disappointed you, but I can no longer study finance. It is against my myself it's, it's stronger than me and i uh, want to do something else different and i i'm doing architecture and it was like mario come on robin who didn't teach you anything i'm like what do you mean he said mario i'm in finance all day if you take money from some if you are rich you're taking money from somebody so my life has been always having to fight my gut feeling my feeling to keep them calm because i was feeling bad the people not having money but in the finance world, you need to think about money, stock market, money, money. And so I had another person that I really validated as one of my mentors telling me, good choice. So all of a sudden, being like the black ship, going against the rule, you know, play Dungeons and Dragons, running on black rocks, was a path, not the right path, was a path that my father and my uncle probably were not. The circumstances were different. They were not probably allowed to do it. Or I don't think they are brave men. And I don't think they were not brave enough. Probably the circumstances were different. Looking back, you know, even just thinking about the young people who are aspired to draw, to yeah. be an architect, you know, what are some words of wisdom that you would like to share with them, even to your younger self? Like, what would you have told your younger self that you know now to help them um, navigate? some of the challenges and struggles and difficulties that you had to go through. I think so. You are now. Architecture is telling the story, telling a story, telling a physical story of the person that is going to live in that space. Uh, I love that approach. Architecture is humble. Luxury is time and simplicity is not precious material. You know, it's being humble, simple. And I think finally, we are going backward. We were going to a weird kind of luxury time in the 90s. Finally, we are trying to understand what's real, what's really important for us. So even architecture is becoming more straightforward, simpler, humble material. And so it's the same thing. Uh, architecture is the expression of a person. Actually, it's not just a person. It's the expression of the team working on that is the, the client and the architect working together so it's a storytelling of people coming together a small community creating something physical that's the message that could be shared to the future but one thing i can tell you is is about taking care of yourself taking care of yourself it's a simple couple of words but it's really important taking care of yourself and the other thing is like think about what it makes you feel happy but it doesn't and trust your feeling inside you know inside what is right and is wrong nobody else can tell you what is right and what is wrong and be brave be brave be courageous trace that line when you open the book trace your line it doesn't have to be the biography of mario martina just trace your line uh i don't want to be ridiculous but the life is really really fast trace your line walk your path don't be scared if you see many curves ahead don't be scared. Face it. Nobody knows where you're going to go. Nobody. Not even you. So just, just trust your feeling. Take care of yourself. Don't let anybody, anybody tell you what is right to do. Mm -hmm. There's no right. There's no right or wrong. It's just believe in yourself. Be brave. Be courageous. I don't believe in talent. 
I believe it's just in passion. Passion is different. Passion is raw. It's this raw energy. And just embrace it. Don't leave it there. Don't leave it in a closet because your mother or your father or somebody else telling you that you should do something else. Embrace it. Be it. Be it. Live it. This is your life. And yeah, you should, you should brave enough to, I think, run on those black rocks. Mm -hmm. Just run. As my father said, run fast <laughs> yeah just focus on running don't focus <laughs> on break your legs or knees <laughs> it's failure my story of architecture and the successes i had it's just about failure failure after failure going back up again failure after failure we're figuring out our path mm -hmm. nobody's perfect don't believe in perfection perfection doesn't exist the beauty is into imperfection we go back there and failure is the only way to improve ourselves, only through failure. Yep. We should continue to tell ourselves as well. The vices that we, we give and we, we live by is so important. The last thing I, I want to make sure is, is there any questions that I haven't asked that you would I have asked? There are a lot of questions about what's your ex your favorite material in architecture what <laughs> pitch that you would love to have why big windows or why small windows uh, i uh, joanna know i love this about you i love this that i can open it up i can show you my weakness we can since the first time i met you we there was this beautiful energy and chemistry where we don't have to pretend to be somebody else just be ourselves and actually i want to thank you for all this memory that you brought me back because I don't think I ever, ever thought about myself from six years old to mm. four years old. And right now I'm realizing how important were some moments in my life that I just didn't even think about again. No. Yeah, I wish I'll have you back again because you have so many good stories that you mentioned in our Starbucks conversation that I wish you know more people would know about because the, the off the path roads you've taken are amazing and it takes a lot of courage to have done what you have done. So this is kind of just on the surface. My story will be nothing if I don't tell about the journey, the trip. Yeah. The trip in Tibet, in India, in Mozambique, yeah. in South Africa, in Argentina, and all the people I met, their hands, I'm obsessed with the hands. All the lessons I learned from everywhere in the world, because the more you travel, the more you explore, you feel home. I'm so looking forward to having that conversation too, because I am just learning about it. And you are so far ahead and you've done this worldly. So, so I can't wait. To close this off, closing this chapter of conversation yeah. of the book, what would show up in a dedication section? Who, whose name would show up in this dedication for your autobiography? I think, as you can imagine, is actually is my, my son and my daughter because life is infinite. And they taught me that we are just a, a sparkle mm. in the history of the whole. And every time I see them, they're really, they're just toddlers. I feel this raw energy, this pureness mm. that we, while we grow, we lose. But I see still there. So after so many failures, after being punk, grunge, after being the black sheep, my son and my daughter are teaching me the best lesson ever that life just goes. It's a cycle and keep on going. And believe it or not, they will go through the same thing. <laughs> they will go through don't believe in themselves. They will go into believe in themselves, in struggle, failures. But that's, that's why we are whole. If people want to find out more about your design, your work as an architect, best place to send them. Okay, so I have a website, ateliermartino.com. Uh, they can find all the projects I've done and the places I've been and the people I've met. And again, each project tells a story and it will take very longer, but every behind every single project, there is a story of people getting together to create what's the creation. And so, yeah, they can find everything there. Thank you for giving your precious time in the day to listen in. I hope you're as inspired as I am 
let Mario's courage to navigate through life's challenges to unfold his true self. I'd like to leave you with this one last thought from Mario. Every single small step, every single action we do has a butterfly effect in the world. Our life is a journey. And nobody can tell you how windy or straight is going to be your path. Nobody except you. Now go create your own butterfly effect and be the change you want to see. Stay curious and be well.